In this jam-packed episode, we dive into a speaker install, as well as take a look at upgrading a proto-throttle in multiple ways, as well as taking a look at a pile rotary beacon and fixing a crossbuck that had an issue. And Colin Bohannon answers the viewer's question of the week. And we cover all this on this episode of the GN in 1970. 70s. As our Atherin RTR GP30 project moves forward, we're installing the speaker using these two brown leads off the ESU decoder. This is an iPhone 4S speaker. It's fairly inexpensive. Find them online for around a dollar a piece if you buy them in bulk. What we've got here is the antenna on the side that needs to be removed. There's small screws that you can just pop this off and toss it aside. Now the speaker itself, it can be modified. I do test it to see how it fits into the locomotive. One thing I do note is nipping down these leads. As you can see there, they do stick out a little bit. I don't want them accidentally touching something that will end up shorting the system out and causing an issue later down the road. I end up tinning the wires themselves as well as tinning the contact points on the speaker. This is just always to ensure good connectivity. Is connectivity the right word? Connectivity. That sounds right, but it looks a little funky. Connectivity. You slow that down a little bit? Connectivity. Got it. And as we move forward, we'll get this thing dialed in. Before we move on to installing the lights, I always test the sound, and this is default ESU. That's the way a decoder sounds when it's fresh out of the box, so now we need to program it. And I end up using an ESU loc programmer that is attached to a PC as well as a section of track. And this is a fairly straightforward process. You go to their website, you locate the locomotive you need, you download the file, you open the programmer, and you end up writing it to the decoder. This has revolutionized and changed the decoder game for my dad and I. We've been able to improve our locomotive sounds and been able to customize them like you wouldn't believe. Let's take a listen. Here's a great northern Pullman standard car built in 1967, captured by Tom Tennyson in the North Town Yard in October of 1982. Do you know what diameter hatches were depicted here? Is it the A, 28 inch, B, 30 inch, C, 33 inch, or was it D, the 36 inch? We'll find out later in this episode. I'm gonna say D, but it might be A. It could be C or B. Thanks, John Madden. A simple upgrade on the proto throttle doesn't take a whole lot. It's kind of a nice throttle, but let's make it look more unique. And that's thanks to DigiKey. And that's simply by the use of this black box. Yeah, it's not what you find on an aircraft. I went with the black, but they do offer the standard gray. They have the beige as well as blue. You can mix and match with the different face plates they offer as well to customize your throttle. It definitely improves the look of the proto throttle. Everything's moving so fast. Slow down. Now this is my kind of pace. Good golly, Miss Molly, we're going to be here forever. Good golly, Miss Molly. It is a simple swap. Clearly, that's a simple and easy way to upgrade your proto throttle. My dad refers to this as murdered out. It's the way the black edition should have been delivered. I couldn't agree more. We're looking at ISE's offering of the Proto Throttle Premium Handle Upgrade. There are four that come in this upgrade. The two additional ones on the left were added to this order, the gray and the yellow. It's definitely a nice addition to be able to put on your Proto Throttle. These things simply screw out and screw in. As you can see here, I'm color coordinating, putting the red on the brake. So if somebody younger is running it, I can just say, throw the red lever. Oh, yeah! yeah simple as that. Looks good. Hey, what are you doing? Yeah, you can't push that. Ah, you're giving that go live. Uh, here's the curmudgeon coming at you by the gripe of the week. All right, we're not really the gripe of the week. It's more of an update on what happened to the curmudgeon. I tell you right now, that cold Bohannon, he's not a very good shot. He tried to shoot me and he hit me right in the left biscuit. Well, turned out that I had a biscuit in my left pocket, and that's where the bolt got lodged, and 
Yeah, it didn't really bleed out. It was, <laughs> it was just some of that jelly packets that I was storing in my pocket. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, when it comes down to this quarantine, it's like Listerine. I can't stand it for more than 30 seconds. And they've got me in this witness relocation program, and I'm witnessing a lot of people relocating. So that's what's happening with that curmudgeon. Today we're going to take a look at a pile beacon. This is a pile 360 degree warning light. The best version of this in HO scale is by Details West RB306. Commonly used by the Great Northern and NP. Beacon. A fairly basic system that we have here, but what I want to do is give you guys a look at the beacon itself, the size of the beacon. That's a huge beacon. Mechanical workings. Yeah, just give yourself a little better idea of what a beacon looks like. So I'll set you down here. First thing I want to do is just give you real quick measurements on it. If you're looking at the height of these, they sit approximately 10 inches tall. From the very front edge to the back is approximately 11 and a half inches. And then the width of these sits just right at about nine inches. Uh, commonly with the NP and the Great Northern, they actually mounted these up on posts. So these, uh, these bolts here, they would have actually been elevated up on posts. And uh, it just kind of ele elevates the beacon just for a little better visibility, I'm guessing. How does it work? Now we're going to look at the internals of this. If I pop the lid, it has been converted to an LED. And Colin, our electrician on the GN in 1970, can cringe and look away. But this is what we've done. I've taken the original leads that originally had gone to in incandescent terminals. I have disconnected those and then wired them up to the internal workings of an LED bulb. Now this is the original lens uh, that uh, it was burnt out and it was actually cracked. So I just cut the top off so the terminals were exposed. You can see the LEDs down inside there. It is a general electric lens, but we're powered by, I believe it's a Philips or a knockoff LED light bulb. You'll see the bottom of the light bulb uh, below once we close this up. We'll show you the underworkings. Here's the light bulb I made reference to. That section that's on the top, I cut the light bulb top off. I obviously removed the LED portion. I wired it up to the top through those wire leads that are running through the posts of the beacon and then mounted this all up so I have myself a, a light bulb that will illuminate the top. And that's how I went about it. Now everything else is original. The wiring is all original. Uh, I wanted to keep it as original as possible, um, but it runs off a 75 volt DC, as I've mentioned. 74 volt. Here's the motor with the worm gear, drives the, the gear here, which obviously spins the mirror on top of the beacon. So you got a pretty good idea of how the inner workings work. How do you power it? The power supply that I am using is referred to as a 74 volt DC transformer. Uh, this transformer was acquired on eBay from a guy that was selling them. I, I googled 74 volt DC transformer. I talked to him. I says, I'm trying to light a beacon. He says, light a what? I said, light a beacon that came off of a railroad locomotive. And he says, I'm not sure what that means, but yes, I have a 74 volt DC transformer. And uh, without further ado, that's how uh, we're powering this up. We might as well let you take a look. I don't care what you do. I'm getting out. So as I mentioned, these were used by the Great Northern as well as the uh, NP, but they're also used by the GBW, number 316. Now at the Minnesota Commercial. That's one of these beacons that would have sat upon it. I just like the mechanical inner workings of some of this type of stuff, so I think it's cool to see that's how it works. Simple light, mirror, spinning around. So in case you're wondering how a pile beacon looked or worked, now you got a better idea. Hopefully you enjoyed this information. Can we see 316 again? Sure. Alright, it's time to find that answer to what diameter hatches are depicted on this Pullman standard car. If you said C, 33 inch, you'd be wrong. It was B, 30 inch. It was an advantage of the round hatches that it was better to seal and safeguard against moisture and contamination in products like fertilizer and so forth that might be hauled in this car. 
Now, Tangent Scale Models did make this car an HO scale, but they did the number series after this. If you want to kit bash it, you can do the round hatches. Oh, what's the deal with the light? As you can see, the cross buck needed a little repair. I used a rope light to be able to backlight it while we had a little bit of an issue. There was a custom made hanging device to be able to mount it to the wall, but that's the least of our issues. I end up using a cable clamp to be able to hold the rope light in place while it's uh, sandwiched between some MDF and the actual cross bucks themselves. As you can see here, we've made the repair. We get it hung back up and wow, we'll plug it in and see how it looks. <laughs> Cross buck like you've never seen it before. Way too theatrical. <laughs> All right, uh, this is a good look. <laughs> what kind of modeling we're talking about? You done shoot about as good as you model. All right, this is Cole's question of the week. It's about hardware. People ask, you go to the hardware store to get hardware? Yeah. Not that kind of hardware. We're talking about railroad hardware. The real stuff, the real deal, the real thing that came off the locomotive. Maybe it came off trackside. It just came from somewhere that was actually part of the railroad. That's just history. That's all that is. And you're preserving it. You're really kind of a historian. People that say it's a waste of money, a waste of time. Well, I tell them, so was buying all those extra engines. That's what it really comes down to. That's Colin's take. Pollen's out. Hopefully you enjoyed this most recent episode of the GN in 1970, and even if you didn't, you can pop over to the channel and take a look and see if there's a video there you might like. There's the GN in 1970, the virtual tour of the GN in 1970, as well as Sue the Milwaukee Road. I want to give a huge thanks to those that have hit the like button, hit subscribe, as well as commented on various videos. It means a lot to me because we've actually connected as modelers and be able to learn different tips from one another, as well as learn about other channels and guys that are sharing content. I don't make these videos for me, I make these videos for you, so hopefully you're enjoying them and you enjoy the future episodes of the GN in 1970. 70s.